what do tunnels do and not do for you? And um, what about bedding? You know, what do you need to know when you're making beds for um, plastic mattresses? So the first thing you need to know about tunnels is, you know, what kind of changes do they make in the environment? And probably the most dramatic one, the one you first notice, is when you walk in there in the middle of the day, the daytime temperatures are higher, of course, right? Greenhouse effect and all that. You'd think that the nighttime temperatures are higher too, but unless you have a really tightly sealed tunnel where the ends are very well sealed, unlike the one in the picture, the nighttime temperatures are not higher. So, you know, they won't be um, a substitute for frost protection. Um, you know, if it freezes outside, it's probably going to freeze inside as well. Um, the second difference that they make, and this is probably the most dramatic one as far as strawberry quality goes, is they decrease the leaf wetness times. You know, all those dews, all those rainfalls, they don't happen in the tunnel. There's very, very little leaf wetness in in the tunnel, which means that your foliar disease is much less inside than outside. Um, more importantly, it means your fruit disease, you know, the tritus, the rhizopus, all those fungal diseases that rely on uh, leaf wetness really don't do nearly as well inside a tunnel as they do outside the tunnel. Um, I didn't put it up here though, but as, as you would guess, by decreasing leaf wetness and by increasing the daytime high temperatures, the humidity is lower, right? And that means that sometimes things like powdery mildew that usually isn't a problem outside the tunnel can become a problem inside the tunnel. So if you don't grow, if you grow a variety that's really susceptible to powdery mildew, it's, you're really going to see it in the tunnel. Fortunately, algae and the seascape are not particularly susceptible. Tunnels reduce the wind, um, obviously. They also increase the soil temperature. You're getting a bit of boost in soil temperature by using a mulch, a mulch bed, especially if you're using black plastic. But you also get a boost in soil temperature from using the tunnel because those daytime temperatures are higher. And as you go through the season, that tends to accumulate. So in the tunnel, the increased soil temperature will often mean that you'll start harvesting a little bit sooner in an open-end tunnel like this for us in Washington, it's not a huge difference, but you might start five to seven days earlier. Um, and it means that um, the gap, you know, it starts earlier. If you've grown day neutrals before, you know that many of them have a gap between the June season and the later season, right? So when you're in a tunnel, that whole cycle shifts forward a little bit maybe five days, maybe seven days. So the stuff in the tunnel starts to gap sooner, it drops off before the, the material outside, and then the second season starts a little bit sooner too. Yeah, so some of these things I've already talked about. There's reduced botrytis. The biggest thing really, really is a longer shelf life less botrytis, there's less of the other fungal diseases, and what that means is that when you harvest product, it stays looking good on the shelf a lot longer than open field material usually does. For us in Washington, you know, sometimes we'll have a really, really rainy June, so the June fruit, you can see a huge difference in the quality in the outside fruit and the tunnel fruit, because the outside fruit has been rained out a bunch, it's soggy, and it's very short shelf life. Nobody wants to handle it. Um, but the tunnel material is much better quality. That difference is a lot less in, say, August and September, when even up north we reliably have pretty good weather. And you have really good weather down here. So you, you won't see that difference as much in the latter part of the day neutral season. But you sure see it early on. So this is all the wonderful things on this side. This side's all the, the awful things about tunnels, right? In, in my experience with tunnels, um, we grew on a spot that started out having a really moderate verticillium pressure. Um, 
And through three years of growing lettuce and strawberries on the tunnels, we managed to inflame that into a raging verticillium problem. Um, and it was worse in the tunnels than it was outside. Perhaps because that soil temperature is a little warmer. <coughs> Verticillium really likes warm temperatures. So if you're going onto ground um, in which you have any cause to suspect verticillium, if you're going on ground that you know has vert from another crop, if you're going on ground and you're following potatoes or tomatoes or any other solanaceous crop, um, you should be aware that Having tunnels is probably going to exacerbate your verticillium problem. Um, I haven't seen it so much in Washington. We don't tend to have bad mite problems on our strawberries, but certainly in many places people do. They're often exacerbated in the tunnels. Um, it's drier in the tunnels. The mites really like that. They do well with it. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, there's more powdery milk. But for us, when we were growing um, our, our uh, strawberries in Washington, we found that we could manage these. We could manage verticillium by choosing our rotations carefully. We could manage mites pretty easily with either chemical or biologicals. We could manage powdery mildew pretty easily by picking the right varieties. Um, the reduced botrytis was difficult for us to manage without a really uh, strong chemical program. So the tunnels had a real advantage for us for reducing the botrytis and for longer shelf life. So I think that's the, the take home on that for us. Um, this is just to show you the difference. It's, for us, it was a really moderate difference. This light colored, uh, excuse me, this light colored line. Is, um, is, in a, is productivity in a tunnel. This is going June through October. Uh, the dark colored line is Albion in an open field. And so you can see they both have an initial flowering and fruiting. There's the gap, which is offset. And then they both start up here for the major harvest season, August and September. And again, the tunnel is a little bit earlier. Not a lot, five to seven days earlier. And it goes a tiny little bit longer at the end of the season. I think I'll skip over the disease ratings. We already talked about these, these particular things just to let you know. You know the, the disease is much less in a tunnel. The, the gray mold, the tritus, is much less in the tunnel than it was outside. But the verticillium was worse. This is from an early year, 2010. That verticillium just kept getting worse and worse as we, uh, as we went on. So there's a lot of different types of tunnels, many, many different styles. But I guess you could lump them into two groups. You could lump them into three season tunnels and four season tunnels. Okay, three season tunnels, like these, are typically um, they're temporary structures. Uh, many people will bend the, um, the metal for them on site. Um, you often see them ganged up one against the other, you know, so you can cover acres and acres with uh, joined three season tunnels. They're much less expensive than, uh, than four season tunnels. You can cover an acre with maybe about $12,000. Um, but they are not nearly as durable as four season tunnels. And there's an example. Right? This, is a, this was a late windstorm that we had in the Skagit Valley. It was a May windstorm, which is unusual for us. So we thought we were being smart. We, had, we kept our plastic down on our three season tunnels until um, mid April. We figured, okay, we're pretty much done with the gales. We put our plastic up. And uh, we got hit early in May with this windstorm that came from the west hit the tunnel broadside rather than on end. And you know, we lost this tunnel. You can see not only is the plastic in tough shape, but the metal structure itself is bad. Um, on the other hand, four season tunnels are usually, as you can see, 
It's a lot more elaborate structure. They're much more expensive in general. Um, almost always, they'll have closed ends like these. So you can close them up. In a tunnel like this, you really can expand your season much more than you can with a three-season tunnel because you can keep them warmer at night. So you can expand into an earlier market uh, in the spring. Um, that brings other issues. You know, when you have a, a <coughs> contained space like that, you have to manage humidity as well. Also brings issue of managing equipment. With three season tunnels, you know, we were able to just use our field tractors, use our field equipment to lay beds, to <coughs> cultivate, to do what we needed to do. And just drive in and out of the open ends. You can't do that with this kind of tunnel. So you need specialized equipment, um, usually more like greenhouse equipment. Um, but they sure are durable. Uh, we worked with a guy in Lubbock, Texas, <laughs> who grew uh, strawberries actually very successfully in four season tunnels there. And you know, we thought it was a big deal when we got a windstorm that had peak winds of 50 miles an hour. We thought, wow, that's pretty bad. Well, these guys would have days and days where it's 50 mile an hour winds. And they'll have, you know, months go by when, when peak winds are always above 20 miles an hour during the middle of the day. So they have wind to contend with all the time. And in an environment like that, you know, they use four season tunnels. And the guy's a pretty good photographer, I gotta say. Um, but you can see this was after several days of 50 mile an hour winds. The skin was ripped off of the tunnel, but the tunnel is intact. With essentially no structural damage to that tunnel. So that's, that's the two basic families of tunnels. You, know, you, kind of, you get what you pay for. Um, if you use a tunnel, if you choose to use a tunnel, your big benefit is probably going to be better shelf length. Um, on bed shapers, that was the second thing I was asked to talk about. Uh, you know, you can grow plastic culture strawberries without having a dedicated bed shaper. You can just use your rotor tiller, you can make up you know, a nice fine seedbed like texture, and then you can take some discs and you can heap up beds in your field. And you can make that work. You can lay mulch over that and you can tuck it in so the wind doesn't blow it away. And you can make it work. You can get strawberries to work. But if you are going to grow plastic culture strawberries to any extent, if you're going to stay with it, I would encourage you to invest in a bed sheet. And there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one is that a well-formed bed with a dark plastic on it heats up sooner in the spring than a bare ground. It also heats up better than sort of a casually made bed. And here's the reason for that. If you look at, say, these two examples, right? Here's a, here's a bed shaper. It doesn't have a plastic on yet. But you see how smooth the surface of the beds are, right? There's not a lot of air pockets. So if you just come through and you heap up beds with your discs, they're not going to be that smooth. And you might say, well, well, why does that matter? Well, the reason that it matters is that when you put the plastic on, if you've got a smooth surface, the soil is always in contact with that plastic. And you know, soil conducts heat pretty well. So when the plastic heats up, the soil conducts the heat away from the plastic and the soil warms up well. On the other hand, you know, if you've got just sort of a casually made bed that's sort of lumpy, well, those lumps all make air pockets in between the plastic and the bed. And so now that air, those air pockets are great insulators. When the plastic heats up, the heat bumps up against the insulators and the soil doesn't heat up as well. So a well-formed bed heats up better than a casually made bed does. The other thing that Tom, Tom Bauman had alluded to is that if you don't have, you know, the plastic on there tight, have a well-formed bed, um, you can get rain puzzles that accumulate on the plastic. And of course the strawberries are miraculous at finding the rain puddles and trying to grow in the rain puddles. You know, and believe me, it's not a happy thing. You don't want to see that. So with a bed shaper, what you get is 
The plastic is there, it's on there tight. There's usually a bit of crown. You can see on the example there that that shaper has a bit of a crown to it. And so the rain just rolls off. And you don't have places for the fruits to sit and accumulate water. About five minutes? Okay, thanks. Um, the two sort of families of bed shapers are adjustable and mixed. And, um, you know, if you are a, uh, a mixed vegetable grower, if you also grow, say, a pumpkins, squash, tomatoes, things like that, you might like an adjustable bed shape because you can, you can control the height, you can control the width. Um, they, they're great for that. They're very flexible. You can use them for your other crops as well. But they have disadvantages, too. The beds really only go up to about 8 inches high. It's not quite high enough for the best kind of strawberry beds. Um, the other disadvantage with a lot of these, like the one in the picture here, is that the sweeps are kind of wide. And it's difficult to get the beds really close together. And so you wind up wasting space. Like the closest we could put our beds together with this adjustable shaper, we could get them maybe five, six feet apart at the very closest. Um, but it was tough to do. So we always wound up with more alleyway than we'd have liked to have between the strawberry rows. Wind up wasting space. Um, the alternative to that would be something like this, a fixed bed shaper. This particular one is made by a company called Kenco, and you can buy them that will make one bed or two beds or three beds wide. It all depends on the horsepower that you have and what you want to spend. But one thing that you'll notice is that the alleyways, you know, they're really just wide enough to walk in, which is what you want. It's, you're using your space efficiently. The sides on these beds are very, very steep, so they, they present well to the sun in the... Uh, as the sun's rising and setting, they warm up more quickly, and they're higher. You can get them 12 inches or more. Um, the downside of these is that they make the, you know, the they make the perfect strawberry bed. Those beds are not all that great for other things. You know, for other things, you don't really need the steep sides. You don't really need the narrow alleyways. Um, they're not quite the right thing. So if, if you're using a better just for strawberries, I'd recommend this. If you want to use it for other things as well, I'd recommend the other type. I must be getting close on time, so uh, if there's any questions, any comments that people want to make, because there's a lot of people in here that have more experience with betters and tunnels than I do. And Tom Bowman, if you want to come back up and we can um, address questions for both of you. How many years are you getting out of the tunnel for your strawberries? Well, um, we would get about three years out of the plastic skin. And I'm talking about the soil. How long can you be in that spot with strawberries in there before you have disease and oh. you can't plant back into it with strawberries? I would, I, would, um, I would move it every cycle. Unless you were fumigating, I would move every cycle. You must fumigate between the cycles. You know, on our site, you would have to because of the very simple. Yeah. Um, and I would imagine you have plenty of diversity down here in the valley as well. Here and there. Yeah. Question over here. Over here. That's for you. Oh, just a comment. Um, I agree with you about your observations about minimum night temperatures in those open end tunnels. I think we're getting some frost protection because of the reduction in radiation cooling on the leaf surface. You do? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm just, just from experience of, in uh, Central Mexico, high elevation, yeah. where we're not getting frost injury on blossoms at temperatures that we would in the outside. Okay. Uh, you know, and it might be three or four degrees. It's not a lot, but there might be something yeah, going on. Three or four degrees. Well, in yeah, a long time, that's very good. Well, you yeah, I mean, I'm just going by observation. I don't have any science behind it. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I, I don't. When when we looked at our temperatures in our open end tunnels, yeah. you know, we couldn't we couldn't find any difference in nighttime. I on those. 
But maybe there is some kind of protection that you get by not having to do that. Yeah, it seems like there's something going on. You, you, you do, I agree with you, Tom, and I agree with you, Tom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, I agree with you because in, when we have corn production, uh, the sweet corn production, we also put the, um, you know, the perforated plastic on top of it, and that has the same effect. It stops uh, at least, if, if it goes down to minus one in Celsius or 30, let's say, in Fahrenheit, um, it can stop that. But if we're going down to uh, 25 or something like that in your scale, uh, you scoop no matter what. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that. Yeah, a little, a little bit of protection, I agree with. Yeah. A little bit. Does the length of the tunnel make any difference? So does, does the length of the tunnel make any difference? Well, the biggest difference that I could think of is if, if you're harvesting them, you know, how far do you have to walk them out of, the, out of the end of the tunnel? So I think a lot of the tunnels are limited to maybe 200 feet or so for just that practical harvest reason. Um, I can't think of any you know, major reason that the length would be a difference for a three season tunnel because they're often vented from the sides anyway. You, know, you go through the vent along the side anyhow. Um, for four season tunnel, I don't know, Richard? In the summer, when it gets hot, the heat can build up. We find a little bit shorter, well, around 200, 200 foot long because you have them side by side and you have a, a, a few acres together. Oh, yeah. The heat will build up in the center there. In the center of the row, so we've had 300 foot length and I think 200. If, but, but then you have shorter rows, a lot more end pieces to your tunnels, so it's a little bit more expensive. You know, plus, making lanes if you have multiple uh, sections in the field. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I just can ask you, Richard, Richard, do you think down here being a little bit warmer than where we're <coughs> better to stay with a shorter Yeah, length. or some type of venting, you know, in the centers there for pushing up the sides. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's an issue. You know, the monitoring is the key in Paris. <coughs> Mid-summer um, management issue. I, I've seen in Central Mexico where they cut or left a blank spot in the middle of the 300 foot. And then they might have another piece that's higher up over that. Yeah. But it acts like a chimney. You know, it helps draw the air from yeah. both ends. Another way uh, on that is to use different colored plastics uh, and use some of the uh, light dispersing plastic. I've had really good results with that, where the light's coming from all sorts of different directions. And uh, we actually get more light into the canopy. That way, without the heating effect with the ultraviolet cover. So, there, there are some more options if you want to get really sophisticated. But this is not the point of today's session, I think, to get that technique. I guess there's ways. Yeah, there are ways. I've had a couple of growers ask me about alternatives to the black plastic. Have either of you had any experiences with the bio mulches? Well, the bioplastic mulches? Not directly, but Carol Miles has done some work. Um, yeah, and vegetables. Right? And I think well, she's done some good work on, on the degradability, evaluated a number of different films for the degradability. So the, the issue with those films is that you, know, you want them to be, to be broken down at the, at the end of the year, and you want to be able to incorporate them and not eat chunks. But with strawberries, it's a little bit more, a little bit different than vegetables in that you, you need them, them to stay good and intact for a little bit longer time. Be, extre be extremely careful with that. Uh, I wouldn't suggest it. Uh, and while we're talking about incorporating, please don't ever uh, incorporate the plastic mulch into the soil. You know what? I would say that, you know, talk. If people are interested, they should talk to Carol because there are some newer products. And, and I agree entirely. The old products that were out, they said they were degradable. They were not. And there are, you know, there are cars years. around the country that are, that are forever polluted with yeah. chunks of plastic. Yeah. So, but there are some newer products that, if I remember right, Carol 
seen some positive results with it. But I'd be also a little skeptical about, well, will they last long enough for a full strawberry cycle? And in the hotter regions, let's say in California or in Florida, people are using uh, the clear plastic. The clear plastic gives you some solarization of the soil underneath while the plants are not big enough. Uh, what I found, if I establish the canopy of the plants on the black plastic fast enough, there's enough shading that when it does get hot, uh, the shade provides enough um, heat prevention so we don't get that overheating. If you're late in planting, uh, come late May in our regions, uh, we usually get a week of uh, hot, uh, you're going to see the first leaves to shrivel up. And that's really bad in the summer if the canopy isn't filled. Yeah. Uh, we can't do clear plastic in our regions because all we're going to do there is provide a wonderful tunnel for weeds to grow in. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's Hopeless. Yeah, we do it to grow weeds. We don't get enough sun. Although, you know, with, with my experience with plastic culture, we actually planted in the fall. We uh, tried to get, when we could, we would get plug plants. We've also used successfully high elevation plants. We've had better luck planting in the fall than we have in the spring. So we would take high elevation as soon as we could get them, you know, usually early in October. Um, but we had the very best luck planting the plugs in the first or second week of September. Uh, and that worked really, really well for us. So I don't have as much experience with the spring plants. And uh, I, I agree with you, fall plantings, if I could get my growers to actually do that, it would be great, but and nobody has the time at that time. They're uh, either still harvesting something else or clean up, uh, and then come October, November, it's too late, so then it's going to be spring. So maybe one more question, if there's some burning questions on the table. When you're planting those in the late fall like that, are you getting production increase over when you plant in the spring? Yes. Yeah, with Albion, we did. Um, we got more production. It was noticeable that we got, you know, we got a June crop the first year, which we did until we planted in the spring. And we also got a, a larger August-September crop, because the plants were really beautifully established, you know, by the time we had the first production cycle. So you probably don't have to take flowers off, right, in that system? Uh, when you do the spring planting, uh, you first want to establish a root system and you want to establish a plant. If you forget to do that, you kind of uh, see the uh, yield nose dive and the plant is a, a bonsai. You can sell it as a bonsai, that's about all you can do. Uh, you take the first two rounds of uh, flower trusses that come out off and then you establish a proper plant and then let it go in fruit. They're surviving through the, the winter like that as a yeah. bare wood at that yeah. size. You guys haven't had any problem with them freezing out like no. last year? No. Everybody thinks because they're from a California variety they should die in the winter time. They don't. They don't. They do, they do fine. You talk about planting them in August? September? Or uh, I've done, well, the, the very best things, the very best results I've had is with plugs first week of September. That was the best for me. Uh, but I've also had great results with high elevation plants, which are a lot more easily available, um, planted early in October. Now don't plant too early in the year, because then you're still going to get the heat and you're going to struggle with that. Yeah. yeah there's, there's, there's an optimum time, which is probably different for you than it is up north for us. Yeah. Tom? I just wanted to, to see if one of the youngers had a comment. I mean, you guys have been developing a, a bed shaper on farm that you are going to commercialize, I think. And I, how, how does the thing that you're developing compare to these on the screen? It's similar. We're not developing it. Brian is. Brian is? Yeah. And which is separate from our farm. Is that clear? <laughs> is we're that commercializing it, I guess. <laughs> but we're trying to. Right. You're sure? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's very similar in, uh, to that one on the uh, left side of the screen. Cool. I guess a follow-up question to that would then be, you know, either in BC or in Washington, you know, what have you, what have you seen the most of? You know, people purchasing uh, directly from either of these suppliers or are they kind of, you know, throwing things together themselves? 
throwing things together themselves. Yeah, that's what I see. Maybe not the best words, but... No, it, it's not very difficult to make one of those yourself. When it comes to the plastic layer, that's usually a different case. There's more pieces, more yeah. many pieces, but... Yeah. It, it's not very difficult. No. If somebody has a workshop anyway that can put this together, it's just fine. All right, well, I think we'll uh, take a break right now, 10, 15 minutes. But thank you to both Hans. <laughs>
uh, again, cooling is the key. By doing a properly cooling, what you can do is you can remove the field heat. That's uh, what I'm trying to mention this uh, cold chain. The cooling should start right after fruit harvest. Because again, at the warm temperature, accelerated uh, respiration rate. After I will show you the pictures, you can see the difference. Uh, also, uh, <coughs> by reducing the respiration, uh, reducing water loss, also uh, decrease sensitivity to ethylene. So this is just a, a big statement. Even after picking, a uh, strawberry remains alive and produces heat as a natural consequence of respiration. Give you an example, see how the temperature impacts. If you store at uh, 1 degree C or 32 Fahrenheit, a ton of strawberry produces approximately 3,100 BTU per day. But if moved to room temperature, that's 41,000 BTU. You can see that's a huge difference. So this curve gives you an idea how this fungi decay happens depending on the storage temperature. This is the time, and this is three different temperatures. One is uh, 0 degrees C, 5 degrees C, and uh, 20, uh, 10 degrees C. You can see how quickly this decay happens depending on the storage temperature. Microorganisms, majority of them just like a warm temperature. Um, so what means maintain a cold chain? Maintain a cold chain means you want to cool them as quick as possible. So for when picking in the field, trying to uh, make several small trips to the cooler instead of wait for too long in a warm uh, temperature. Then um, keep the product cool in the field. So when picking, you can use shade and a mixed system when the uh, relative humidity is lower to prevent <coughs> transmission. And also pay attention to air flow how you stacking them together and the box bending. Also load into the refrigerator trans, uh, transit as quick as possible if you transport your fruits from one location to another. Unload into the refrigerated storage quickly after uh, move to another lo uh, newer location. Also during a uh, retail display and try to keep uh, cold temperature. Not only that, you need to keep monitoring and uh, measuring the temperature at each step, at each uh, point by using a temperature record. So uh, when looking for cold storage methods, there are different ways. One is the uh, mechanical refrigeration, mainly named forced air cooling or room cooling. That's one most popularly used. Or you can use evaporative cooling. That's much quicker and more efficient, but the, the unit is much more complicated than forced air. Or you can use hydro cooling, or, or ice cooling, or vacuum cooling. These two are not practical for fresh strawberries, but has been used for other fresh produce, especially hydro cooling for cherry has been used quite successful. Ice cooling most for vegetables. So really come to fresh strawberries, you have very limited choices. So for uh, when storage in a walking cooler, there are a couple of things I just want to uh, point it again. A uh, set point should be between uh, 32 to 36 Fahrenheit. What that means is you want to keep strawberry as close as to 0 to 2 degrees Celsius as possible for extending shelf life. Uh, also again, retaining higher relative humidity, 90 to 95 percent, to prevent transmission, to uh, retain, basically retaining the water in the strawberries. Um, also, you want to uh, map in the uh, temperatures throughout the room and store product at the best temperature available. So I will show you the pictures. Don't believe you have a cold storage room, all the points, temperature are the same, which is not true. So you want to make sure you retain a uniform temperature in the cold room and avoiding some uh, spots to prevent the warm or overcooling. So these are the spots you want to pay attention. By the door, it's warm, trying to avoid that place. Also, in the back, it's cool. You also want to avoid that spot because you don't want to freeze your uh, fruits. 
And also, again, here, yes, should be stored as close as to 34 Fahrenheit as possible, and also away from high air velocity. This reason, yes, again, preventing water loss. So, a few other things about uh, storage in walking cooler. Uh, using air curtains in doorway and uh, maintain in good conditions. Uh, again, just uh, preventing warm air getting into a, your uh, cool room. Also, keep door closed when not um, ending an uh, uh, existing uh, door uh, cooler. Just trying to, again, maintain the cold temperature. Also, upgrade or calibrate or warm temperature away from the door. Make sure you get your uh, correct reading in the uh, temperature in the room. Uh, if possible, minimize your storage time. So uh, this are uh, just uh, a few pictures give you the ideas. This is the door with the curtains, and this is the area nearby the door, so can be the warm spot you want to avoid. It. And these are the other areas you can see. This is a fan. Again, this is uh, when. I used to, um, my first job, in fact, it's an engineer for a design refrigerator. So we did a lot of this, uh, you know, monitoring works, trying to make sure the uniform air circulation in the cooler, again, depending on the size of the cold room, depending on how the uh, fans goes, the air uniformity may change significantly. So those are the two spots, the temperature could be very, very different. So make sure when you have this uh, thermal cup in your cook room, you have different spots, you get a more uniform reading, <coughs> so you put your product in more uniform uh, cold areas. Um, next one is just in the, uh, when you display your product, also want to uh, make, sh make, sure, I mean, uh, make sure they are in the cold uh, temperature. So temperature manager can be a challenge in a display, okay? So again, a balance between a display designed to uh, increase sales and needs to maintain lower temperature. I'll show you a couple pictures of what this means. You want to the display looks good, but at the same time, you also want to make sure your product stored in a cold temperature. Sometimes it can be challenged, so you need to have a good balance on that. And uh, again, rotation is the key. Uh, times uh, on the retail sales, product goes and ins. Retail is the key, so especially for non-refrigerated display, you want to check every two, two hours. So, uh, for example, this is a beautiful display, you know, really uh, stimulating the sales. And um, here, this is the refrigerated display. So, I'll show you another picture. Uh, in fact, I just want to uh, say a few more words about this uh, refrigerated display. There are different types. You can contact the supply to uh, based on your needs. To uh, they have different design that means is hot air, cold air circulated. Okay, so you want to talk to the supply to meet your needs. So um, you want to again for the retail display to maintain a lower temperature as close as to 36 to 38. Uh, don't allow foods to warm during stock. Again, as close as to 32, it's the ideal situation. Make sure the air supply is uh, uniform, distributed, and also the temperature the thermal cup is calibrated. Um, also, don't uh, obscure air flow in this plane. Again, overstocking can cause the problem. Uh, broke the air vent can be a problem. So again, that, that the design that the uh, display it, it's the key. So this is another type of this company HS, HSC. They are making this uh, produce display depending on the uh, needs. Again, air can be circulated in different ways depending on your needs. You can talk to the uh, manufacturers. Um, this is another one. This is uh, called refrigerated all China beans. Also have a cooling system here. The design is a little bit different from previous pictures. Um, okay, during the transportation, uh, again, the truck has to be refrigerated. You can either using box the truck or truck the trailers, depending on 
the amount of the produced to uh, the fruits you are uh, going to transport from one location to another. Um, temperature recording and monitoring during transportation is the key. Another thing is, uh, show the pictures here, you can use it called thermal uh, basket. Thermal basket is basically, it can overwrap the stock of carton <coughs> on the pallets with a foil laminate the thermal blanket. Based on the manufacturer, you can use, by using those thermal uh, uh, blanket, you can maintain the temperature of 3 degrees C within a carton for up to 36 hours. So really help to retain the lower temperature. Um, so, I don't know how many of you know this uh, USDA porter cooler. Uh, this is the um, uh, cooler <coughs> developed by a USDA research team. So, they have different volumes, uh, 35 to 7 uh, cubic meters inside the space. Um, they are using a cold air is forced through the produced by uh, pressure from a fan in a second wall inside. So um, again, if you want to see more details, I gave the website. You can go to the website to see the uh, hot the cooler. Usually the price is about $1,200. This price is not included a trailer, but the uh, cooling system. So I have a picture to show one of the units. So basically it's a cooling system, the trailer, and the, they have the, the units have different size, can fit the space, different space needs. Um, I saw these two uh, websites, uh, you know, if you're interested to learn more about the cooling system, these two websites give uh, very good information. One is, I believe, by the North Carolina State University Extension. Also, this is from the uh, USA, a very detailed information for the cold chain, from cooling after picking to uh, in a retail display. So uh, the, my rest of the time, I want to talk about other uh, potential technology to further extend the shelf life of fresh strawberries. So um, I will talk about the modified atmosphere storage or packaging, and also talk a little bit about the edible coating. So what is MAP? Um, in the air, you have 20% oxygen, 0.03% uh, CO2 plus nitrogen, right? So what happens is, with such a high oxygen, it's encourage uh, respiration, it's uh, encourage majority of microbial growth. So by using modified atmosphere means, you're going to replace air, you're going to use a pre-mixed gas composition, usually has elevated CO2, reduced oxygen, then balanced with nitrogen. Nitrogen is an inert gas. By doing that, you can extend your shelf life back to strawberry, in general speaking, by reduced oxygen, you can slow down the respiration. You don't want to fully stop it. You want to slow down res respiration. And the carbon dioxide not only create an aerobic condition, but also carbon dioxide is a natural antimicrobial agent. So this technology, you mean, in fact, it's used in many different products today. If you go to like uh, Winkles, you will see some ground pork, ground turkey are packaging it using this kind of technology. Many fresh pasta are packaging it using this kind of technology. The key is, depending on the product, different gas composition are required. So, back to uh, fresh strawberries. General believe by using 15 to 20% CO2, it can significantly control the growth of the tritis. So that's the initial idea. So show you uh, some more detailed information. So by using high CO2, can, uh, so how the CO2, high CO2 can be obtained. There are different ways to obtain high CO2. So but remember this, you know, it, it's always a juggling here. When you packaging fresh berries in a closed container, remember respiration, absorb oxygen, generate CO2, right? So you can use in that nature to generate high CO2. But depending when more, less, more oxygen absorbed it, then respiration slows down. So it reaches some saturation. And also another thing is the packaging film, the, pack, the permeability of the packaging film is the key. 
It has all worked together to achieve that balance to get the best results. So high CO2 atmospheres can be obtained using impermeable plastic bag. That means if the packaging film is not permeable to CO2, when fruit respires, it generates CO2. That CO2 can accumulate it by reach 15 to 20 percent the level. In that case, can stop control the growth of the tritus. Okay, that's one way to do. Uh, so another way is uh, strawberry cartons needs to maintain sealed during entire pure two to three days to obtain this high CO2 benefit. So um, I show you the picture later that uh, Driscoll's has been working with a packaging company to develop a system to achieve this goals. Okay, so based on this, they say uh, the at the one degree C, the shelf life can be extended to 10 to 14 days. Um, this is the ideal gas composition. Again, this depending on the variety of the fruits. Just want to make one more comment. When you're using MAP, has to work together with refrigerated storage. So don't think MAP can replace room storage, no way. So modified and so packaging has to work with refrigeration storage together. So and this is the uh, Driscoll system right now they are using for transporting of uh, fresh strawberries. Uh, you know, I give the website, they have a nice uh, video in YouTube. So to kind of uh, explain how the system works, basically this is a pallet. It's all overwrapped by the uh, packaging plastic films. So they are very low permeability. In that case, accumulated CO2. So can generate high CO2 to prevent the growth of uh, botrytis. Um, however, lately there's some uh, different opinions says when why higher CO2 is good to preventing the uh, botrytis but it may cause reduce of the pH of the fruits, which impact the flavor, cause fizzy or sharp taste of the fruits. So more research being done say, why don't we use elevated CO2? So in this case, it should be some kind of results. So this is the uh, work being done, say using, I give all the references here. So using 80% oxygen, with not CO2, just to generate CO2 by the fruits itself, because with this high CO2 oxygen, can rapid respiration is very fast. It can release more carbon dioxide. In that case, you can see this. Is, I believe this is 60 days even. Uh, this is of course you know what happens uh, with this tech, uh, MAP technology. Fruits look so fresh. Oh, okay. Oh, five minutes. I need to speed up. Okay. So anyway, I'm not going to uh, do this too much here. So this gives you some uh, results. Basically, you know, showing all the positive results on the weight loss and the fruit firmness. So in addition to this, I just want to quickly point it. In addition to MAP, there are other research being done for um, extending shelf life. What is heat? It's very interesting. They say the 50 degree very short for fresh strawberries significant extent shelf life and also uh, uh, another way is used called biocontrol just using another fungi to inoculate it they can become competitors with the tritis can uh, prevent the growth so uh, i don't know how many of you pay attention on this new technology it's a commercial technology called it's fresh basically it's using a strip um, with uh, clay and other minerals to absorb ethylene that's help extending the shelf life. Uh, so last thing I'll talk a little bit is the edible coating. Um, I've been doing this uh, many, many years for edible coating. In fact, I worked with Oregon Strawberry Commission 10 years ago for this technology. <coughs> edible coating is not new. You know, if you buy uh, citric fruits, you buy apples, <coughs> many of them are edible coated. Most products, it's uh, wax coating or these days using vegetable-based coating. The coating is called, it's called a skin packaging, basically it provides barrier to gas and water. But, but all those coatings, unfortunately, they don't have anti-fungi or anti-microbial functionality. What we've been doing in my lab, we use a material called Kydesan. You can see Kydesan, um, I don't know how many of you, I don't have time, I guess. Kydesan is a natural polymorph. It's extracted from shrimp or crab shells. FDA has allowed it, has 
allowed it using as a dietary supplement for binding with body cholesterol for weight control. But this is also a beautiful material can make up films just like a serene films. So the beautiful thing is has a very strong anti-fungal function. So you can see coating strawberries um, significantly control the decay. And we did all the consumer tests that was very well received, unfortunately. By today, Kydesen, it's not approved by FDA for food application, although it's allowed it as a dietary supplement. Okay, so one last thing I just want to um, remind everyone. In fact, in 1986, FDA approved to using a lower dosage food irradiation to control the fungi in strawberries. Of course, no market because of consumers' concern for irradiation. Okay, so last slide. So just the basic uh, harvest, uh, post-harvest principles. Of course, you want to harvest at correct maturity, uh, reduce the physical handling and the damage, also protect the product from sun and cool as quick as you can. Also, uh, keep the packing line or area simple clean, issue good working hygiene, uh, retain cold chain from harvest to retail to the consumers, and a high relatively humidity. Uh, Possible using advanced post harvest technology to further extend your shelf life. Of course, train and compensate your work adequately. Thank you. Yeah, I have a, a list of references. You know, if anyone wants to read. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, I'm just going to ask you guys one question. Mm -hmm. So, thinking about the cooling um, with fresh strawberries. Do you have any idea, like ballpark, what the cost of just putting in some sort of small system would be? Or would you go to the references that you would Yeah, like I said, if you buy this uh, USDA small, that, that's intended for the small scale rollers. I think that's a unit's 1200, but not include the trailer, it's just the units. Otherwise, it's really difficult to say because depending on which kind of cooling, I still believe forced air. That's the one for strawberries, most practical, although there are other technologies. But because of the nature of the berry fruits, they have limited applications. I don't have the numbers. Yeah, no. <coughs> okay. I think it'll be good to have the, um, the details of the links that you had listed mm -hmm. about the different cooling options mm -hmm. um, given out to you guys, whether it be in a bulletin or um, just in the meeting procedures. So we'll be sure to have make sure that you guys have access to that information. Thank you. Okay, thanks.